Thanks for everyone for being here. And um, I'm going to get uh, started right away uh, just because there's a lot to cover on this and uh, I want to make sure we stay right on time. So just to review, we're going to try to cover a few things about the current thoughts of current management of concussion. The last section, prevention, is going to be Dr. Meehan again, and he'll talk a little bit um, about some of the most important parts we've, we've touched on today, prevention, and that's part of what we do at the McKaylee Center. Um, but I'll start right away. Just a, a management overview, okay? This looks like a lot on the slide, but I just want to touch on a few important points, probably even starting with the bottom, because um, I'm going to go on in a moment and talk about sideline management. But the biggest issue with sideline management, when it comes down to it, actually is um, identifying those marginal cases, uh, the, the cases that you're really not sure are they concussion or not. Um, I, I know the, the breakdown of folks who are here, there's a lot of um, coaches, trainers, physical therapists, and, and, and clinicians that I assume, some of which will be on the sideline of managing teams or, or athletes who are injured on the field. I think we'd all agree if there's a, a big collision, obvious uh, concussion symptoms, perhaps loss of consciousness, I think the manage the initial management is fairly clear. We're going to withdraw that, that athlete from the contest, not return them to that game. But the harder decision is really the, the uh, marginal injury, right? The one that has uh, either away from the play, someone gets a, a big collision, they have uh, some symptoms, they don't feel quite right, they either don't recognize it or don't bring it up, and then that athlete's going to be at risk for more collisions. So the biggest risk, and Bill Meehan touched on this earlier, really the athlete, when they're injured with concussion, during that window of time, until they're fully recovered, even collisions that are, would normally be uh, fairly well tolerated, collisions during that window of vulnerability can really increase the symptoms uh, exponentially and uh, contribute to prolonged recovery and perhaps even significant morbidity like second impact syndrome. Um, so we'll talk about a couple tools that we use on the sideline, and, and that's one of the reasons why we really, it's essential to ensure that there's full recovery before we consider return to practice and, uh, and game play. But I'll have you just think about that as one of our take-home messages. For management, once we recognize there's a concussion, we really, uh, the initial and overriding thing is, is rest, right? Physical rest and, and to some degree cognitive rest. Um, so we re remove them from contact sports, and we also suggest to the athletes that they don't go do other higher risk sports that may not be organized sports, so snowboarding, skateboarding, things like that, until they're recovered. Um, we institute physical rest, um, and in the beginning we do aggressive physical rest, but I do want to make sure we, we recognize that there can be some consequences. Just like when we prescribe medications, there can be side effects. When we do aggressive physical rest for too long, we really have to be aware there can be consequences of physical deconditioning. So it's it's, I would say it's not unusual, but it's actually probably more the norm that folks who have done zero physical activity at weeks number two and weeks number three, you can bet there's going to be some physical deconditioning. They can have their sleep schedule interrupted, right? If they're, if they're told to stay home from school, do nothing, and they're kind of sitting on the couch sleeping during the day, then they'll not sleep at night. They'll be exhausted during the day. They'll have, just from that sleep interruption, irritability, trouble concentrating, you know, maybe headaches uh, exacerbated. So we have to be careful with the amount of full physical rest, um, and uh, <clears throat> I often like to try to get them involved where uh, psychologically the, the athletes want to be involved in their recovery. They don't want to really, it's kind of uncomfortable to be just passive and, and just waiting and waiting, but I like to institute stretching and walking early. Later on we'll talk about increasing uh, exercise challenge, but stretching and walking, uh, maybe even physical therapy in certain conditions can really help not only give the athlete a proactive sense that they're involved in the recovery, but also try to mitigate some of that physical deconditioning. And then cognitive rest as well, same idea. We try to uh, do some aggressive cognitive rest or aggressive shutdown. We often uh, recommend some time out of school for those uh, athletes who are significantly symptomatic, sometimes three to five days out of school. But I, in particular, I try to fairly aggressively reintroduce some degree of, of structure to the day, reintroduce some degree of cognitive challenge um, even before, they, they may not be fully symptom-free, but we want to make sure we're not um, contributing to social isolation, um, stress from missing school. And I'll tell you, more, uh, as many times as not, I'm, I'm seeing athlete, student athletes who are stressed not just from missing the big game or missing practice, but just as often they're stressed by missing schoolwork. You know, the conscientious student, they really are aware how much schoolwork is building up, how much they're going to have to make up. <laughs> especially in the high school years, especially junior year, they're very aware of um, their college applications being built by their performance. So 
It's a big stressor when they're out of school, and so we want to make sure we do ag appropriate aggressive cognitive rest, but not necessarily overdo it. Certainly, we're going to keep those athletes out of contact sports until there's full recovery. But we have to make sure we, we keep an eye on uh, preventing deconditioning. And we'll talk a little bit about, <clears throat> um, we'll talk briefly, I'm not sure if we have time, but uh, other uh, treatments outside of um, rest and, and return to play criteria, but for the prolonged recovery. But preseason, I think management starts in preseason. I think uh, the pre, uh, this was also touched on early in the morning, pre-participation exam. That should, I think Pierre uh, Demacourt mentioned uh, the cardiovascular um, review and concussion review. And specifically, I would say you want to look in, if there's concussion history, how many concussions have there been? What was the mechanism? What's the length of time that they had for each recovery? And are there any residual symptoms? Because we'll talk about in a moment, the big, to me, the biggest concern is an athlete, not necessarily who has had the you know, magic number three concussions. That's be, sort of become a magic number. But if we see a pattern where we see an athlete getting injuries from you know, multiple concussions and from lower and lower collisions, lower and lower energy collisions, or longer and longer time for recovery for each of those injuries, that's actually uh, very significant. <clears throat> And then preseason uh, evaluation, I think it's, it's nice, particularly, again, we'll come back to the sideline to, to assess the marginal, that marginal patient, if you will. Um, if we have some degree of preseason baseline balance testing and preseason neurocognitive testing, it helps quite a bit. And I'll show you the, <coughs> excuse me, the um, SAC scorecard that um, I use on the sideline. We do preseason computerized neurocognitive testing. Um, and there are several examples of brands of this. Impact Test is one, Headminder, Cog, uh, Cogsport. But um, they're not really appropriate for the sideline use if you want to make that quick decision. We certainly use them for clinical follow-up and assessing when, it's ready, when the athlete's ready to return to practice games. But when you're talking about preseason, excuse me, when you're talking about sideline assessment, you really have three tools, right? You can get a subjective survey of their symptoms. How do you feel? You can test their physical exam and their balance testing. But every athlete's quite different. And, and third, you can test their cognitive interaction with you. So the balance testing, we use best testing, which is testing their balance on both feet in tandem stance and standing on one leg. We count the number of corrections that they have when they're standing there for 20 seconds uh, with their eyes closed. But every athlete's different, different in, even in different sports. So the football players might average you know, between four and six corrections where um, synchronized skater or gymnast who may have really worked on their balance, they may have one or two corrections total for all three of those stations. So having that baseline is helpful. And when I show you the, um, when I show you the SAC card that I use, you'll see where it's a pretty challenging neurocognitive test. And so people, uh, athletes, student athletes are typically not going to score perfectly on it even when they're healthy. So if you know their preseason score, it's helpful um, at least to make that decision in that marginal case especially. But again, remember that marginal case is the athlete that's at m most vulnerability. They're injured, it may not be clear to all of us, and they have the potential to go back in the game or continue with practices the rest of the week, and that's important to recognize that person. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I think <coughs> the whole team, clinicians, coaches, and of course even, even athletes, <coughs> should be familiar with current management. And I applaud you for being here because obviously you're committed to doing that. Um, I think reading some of the basic stuff, and on the handout, I put a couple of um, references. The, the international consensus statement, I think, is one of, the, one of the most helpful, and that has the SCAT-3 that was uh, referred to this morning, and part of that is the SAC score, the standardized assessment tool that we use. And it looks like this, and um, <clears throat> I laminate it and keep it in my pocket, and they can get a total score of 30. If you're not familiar with this, you get a total score of 30. So you get a point, I'll run through it fairly quickly for time, but... Um, a point each for orientation, day of the week, uh, year, for instance. We give them a word list. Uh, if you try to remember these, for instance, I will say pencil, truck, ball, flag, bubble. And they had a point each for repeating back those lists to me, um, total for uh, 15 for that section. <clears throat> then we'll do a neurologic exam. Uh, we'll do number sequences, which, again, can be challenging. We'll start with three. I'll say four, nine, three. They're expected to say three, nine, four. But when it's six number sequence, seven, one, eight, four, six, two, you can see that's challenging. They're supposed to reply back two, six, four, eight, one, seven. And I know 
without looking up there, I wouldn't be able to do that right now. Months of the year, and then we do exertional maneuvers, right? So we get their heart rate going, sidelines, push-ups, running, sprinting, see if their symptoms uh, return, or if, uh, if they have more difficulty with delayed recall. So they're supposed to be able to tell me again, pencil, truck, ball, flag, bubble, right? You guys all remember that. Um, so it's, they're supposed to remember the, the word trials from the beginning. We'll do this for athletes that come over to me, but the fact is if there's we can do this for every athlete that comes over, but if there are clear symptoms that don't, you know, that are still present by the time we're doing this testing, or uh, there's clear reason to think they have um, even marginal concussion, the athlete's not going to go back to the to that contest, regardless of how well they do on this. That's the new commitment we've made to in the last couple of years in the international consensus statement for young athletes in particular. No longer is it standard to say if the symptoms clear within 15 or 20 minutes, which used to be the standard. It used to be to say, well, if it cleared within 15 to 30 minutes, depending on which um, system you're using, they might be able to go back to that conference. But we've made a commitment to say, if they have symptoms of concussion, even if it's brief, uh, or they had their bell rung, so to speak, they shouldn't go back to that contest. But for those marginal ones where they got hit hard, the coach sends them over to me and wants them assessed. Um, we'll do the symptom score. We'll do you know, these cognitive tests at rest, we'll get them going with their heart rate and we'll see, um, can they go back in? And I think it's important to, uh, I cover Roxbury Latin football, I think it's important to have at least a certain percentage of folks that, uh, athletes that come over, get assessed, and they're told, all right, this looks okay, this looks normal. And the coaches are good about that. If there's a real hard hit, they'll send them over, have me assess them. But if I'm not at least, you know, finding and clearing 10% or so of the athletes and saying, this athlete's okay, they're not injured, then one of two things. Either I'm not seeing enough of the athletes that are potentially injured, right? Or my threshold is, is off, and if every athlete comes over and I say, you're out for the game, you're out for the month, pretty quickly the athletes are not going to report the symptoms to me. So we have to find that balance of a clear assessment, I think. Uh, on the field, so we need to recognize... Uh, each of the coaches and clinicians do um, yearly training. We want to recognize symptoms on the field, most commonly headache. Uh, uncommonly, it's loss of consciousness. That's less than 10% of, of concussion injuries, but when it's present, certainly that's um, quite clear. Sometimes it's subtle change in performance. And then delayed symptoms might be headaches later, difficulty in school that week, sensitivity to light and noise, or change in sleep patterns. When it's recognized as concussion, we take them off the field. Not every athlete will necessarily go to the, the emergency department, but um, for those athletes that we think need urgent evaluation, urgent imaging, frankly, and that specifically CAT scan, would be those that we think could have intracranial hemorrhage or fracture. And those would be the ones with prolonged loss of consciousness. Typically, that's defined as uh, more than a minute, but if you've ever been next, you know, on, on the sideline next to someone with loss of consciousness, a minute it feels like an eternity. So I would say, practically speaking, if it's truly witnessed loss of consciousness more than even 15 seconds, they probably uh, should have imaging. Um, I'll check them out on the sideline after 15 minutes at halftime, end of the game. If they're worsening despite rest and not getting better, certainly we want to reassess that, or if they have focal deficits on their exam. And then we want to plan for outpatient assessment. Uh, where are they going to be seen to be, to be formally assessed and formally cleared once they are recovered? Um, they want communication with parents, of course. Once they're home, we tell them, okay, we want them out of games and practices and avoid uh, other activities like skateboarding that might be accidental collisions. I tell them we try to optimize everything that might potentially provoke headaches anyway, <coughs> sleep, nutrition, hydration, okay? Cause, um, and sleep's important too. So no longer is, it's typically not recommended to, to do those frequent neuro checks, for instance, at home. It, it used to be, well, go home, wake your child every hour. And I think that, that really... Um, came from a concern that there could be an intracranial hemorrhage and that they have a coma. But the fact is, if that's, the, if that's at all a concern, then that athlete should have imaging and should have you know, admission for formal neurologic checks. But really, for concussion management, sleep is very therapeutic, so no longer do we typically recommend the frequent awaking, even though parents may still feel more comfortable being proactive and doing that, checking on their child frequently throughout the night. That's, uh, I mean, that's, that may still be part of what they want to do when they're at home. Um, so we institute uh, cognitive rest, and we get them back to school, maybe with half days and with a note that says they need neuro, uh, some accommodations for longer time for work, so uh, academic accommodations, if you will. 
When they're recovered, then we, we think about really these four criteria. Now, this assumes one other thing. It assumes normal neurologic exam. But the four criteria for return to play is really, and this is kind of a mantra for the, for the residents and folks who work with me in the office. This is what we hear every time, multiple times on an appointment and multiple times throughout the day because I want uh, the same message every time for that athlete when they come in this week and next week. And I think for the sideline team, it's important to have the same message. We're going to pull an athlete that we have any suspicion for injury. These are going to be the criteria for return to play. It helps decrease anxiety, helps to decrease any arguments, so to speak, on the sidelines. And So this is my mantra. Resolution of symptoms. They should have academic tolerance, exercise tolerance, and then normal testing if we're going to do neurocognitive testing. So this is the symptom score sheet we use in the office. It's taken from that uh, SCAT-3 which is available on the um, International Consensus Statement, since you reference in the packet that you have there. Um, and I think it's must-reading for folks uh, who are here thinking about continuing medical education. So it's a Likert score, 0 to 6, for symptoms. They should circle any symptoms that are different than their baseline. If they always have trouble sleeping, and that's the same as usual, it's typically a 0. They never had trouble sleeping, and now they can't get to sleep, they'll score it, whatever it is. We want that back to 0 before we think return to contact. When they have symptoms that are resolved, then we want to make sure they have academic tolerance, right? They can tolerate full days of school, full schoolwork, feel well when they're really studying hard and have good results like they always have. Third, we, we expect exercise tolerance, right? So they should, I, like I said, I'll start them with stretching and walking fairly early, but once they have symptoms that are resolved and academics that are tolerated, then we start with low, medium, and high-intensity non-contact exercise, bike, elliptical, things like that. So... I usually tell them low to medium uh, exercises where we could just about talk to each other if we're sitting on bikes next to each other. Then when they graduate to medium or medium high intensity exercise, then you have to just about take a breath. That's the the level of intensity for medium to to high intensity. And then high intensity is sprint, full out workouts, uh, push-ups, things like that. So we expect a progression from low, medium, and high uh, exercise without symptoms during or after the exercise. And then we'll, uh, so these are the stages we, we just talked about. Successful days, depending on age, we may, if it's professional athlete or, or, or a college athlete with no prior history and brief symptoms, two or three days, we may progress them fairly quickly through each stage, one or two days perhaps. If it's a high school age <clears throat> kid with a, a couple, um, you know, maybe a, a prior concussion last year, we may be a little more conservative, three or four days for each of those low, medium, and high intensity stages. Um, and success means <clears throat> that they do well for school still, and there's no return of symptoms, right? So we'll just generally do a slower pace for younger athletes. Uh, uh, and uh, so those are the first three, right? Symptoms resolved, academics tolerated, exercise tolerated. Um, we may use that, that SAC score or computerized testing at that point to see if we feel like their neurocognitive test is really recovered. And for prolonged recovery, we're considering physical therapy, we're looking for other causes of headache like trigger points, occipital trigger points, or myofascial pain, whiplash, muscular headaches. See if we can improve things with the non-medication interventions like physical therapy and vestibular therapy. Sometimes off-label use of certain medications is being used by clin- clinicians who are familiar with it, but that's a, a bit more advanced and specialized. Lastly, I'll finish up with some of these notes. How many is too many? This comes up all the time from parents and, and, and coaches as well. Answer is unknown. There are some long-term implications for multiple concussions and multiple collisions that, like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is fairly rare and still yet to be worked out. But in general, if there's multiple uh, injuries, and particularly those that are, uh, there's injuries with decreasing force, especially those that are significantly, if you look back and say, well, how much school did you miss, you know, on your prior concussion, and say, well, you know, I had symptoms for, my worst symptoms for a week or two, but I, I really wasn't right for school for two or three months. That's a huge significance to me. If there's longer time for recovery on each injury and persistent symptoms, then they really should be thinking about sometimes taking a, a year um, out to, to ensure good academic performance and allow for physical maturity, work on uh, bulk and strength, some of the things that Bill Meehan will be talking about, proprioception, balance, neck strength. Uh, they may consider change of position or retirement from certain collision sports at that point. But it, that, those are long discussions, retirement discussions, even at young age. As you guys know, this is why you're here. The athletes are serious about their sports. They really enjoy them. So it's a, that's not a small decision. 
And just lastly, the young athletes are particularly vulnerable. They have unique responsibilities separate than the pro athletes. They really have two jobs. They have academics and their, and their sports, and they take both very seriously. So they have very unique uh, vulnerability. So take home message, low threshold to sit them out. Physical and cognitive rest is the, the hallmark of treatment, but just remember there are some consequences with deconditioning, so we just want to keep that in mind. Uh, have a plan for follow-up and an organized, clear uh, return to play plan that everyone can follow consistently. If there's prolonged symptoms, consider referring. These are just references that are in that handout that you have, and I'd recommend reading the consensus statement, and that's where the, the SAC score and the SCAT tool is available for free. Um, and there's a couple other references I put in there, including um, uh, a note, uh, a paper about uh, academic accommodations. So I will finish there, and I appreciate your patience, and we'll move on to the next talk. Thanks so much.